I mentioned this morning about the importance of this lesson tonight. You know, in the first century, so many people uh, inside that body of Christ was, uh, was looking for Christ to come soon. Well, as we mentioned this morning briefly, and we'll go back there just to kind of get us started in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, notice <clears throat> how he begins in verse 1. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him... We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So there in the first century, some were teaching that Jesus Christ had already come. Now, First and Second Thessalonians were written some of the earliest writings in the New Testament. So these were written probably less than, almost definitely less than 20 years after Jesus had died. So think about that. So there were people writing letters, going around saying that Jesus had already come. His second coming had happened and, and they had missed it. And we think, you know, uh, how, how, could, how could anybody in the first century believe that? But Paul understood that it was something for them to be concerned about. So he spent some time in this letter showing that wasn't true. Well, since that time, that belief that Jesus came, <clears throat> second coming, his last coming in the first century, is still with us. And in the past 20 or 30 years, has actually uh, came to be uh, uh, quite a movement in some places. Uh, this... Uh, Teaching goes by three or four different names. Sometimes it's called the AD 70 theory because, in essence, as we'll see tonight, the idea is that everything happened in AD 70. Christ's second coming was in AD 70. The resurrection was in AD 70. The judgment was in AD 70. The end of the world was in AD 70. So that's why it's sometimes called the AD 70 theory or doctrine. It's also sometimes given the long name realized eschatology. Eschatology is just the study of end times or final things. Realized means it's all happened. And then sometimes it's named after the guy that basically started it in the churches of Christ, and that was Max King back in the early 70s in Ohio. He was a gospel preacher there for one of the churches. <clears throat> He wrote two books early on that basically taught his doctrine and, and still in newsletters and so forth, this is being propagated all over the country. Uh, the first one was The Spirit of Prophecy, he wrote in 1971. The second was The Cross and the Perusia of Christ in 1987. <clears throat> and again, uh, him and his followers, adherents are still teaching that through the use of, of newsletters and, uh, and the Internet and, and a number of different ways. But that's what basically the theory says, is that there are no prophecies left to be fulfilled. Every single thing mentioned in the Bible has happened. Everything. And that is the foundation of their belief. In other words, by A.D. 70, everything that was ever going to happen that was prophesied happened. Now, you might say, how in the world could people believe that? Well, there are a lot of people, and this is mainly in the churches of Christ, but there are some outside of it. And again, some not all that far from here. You go a couple hours west of here, you'll start to find some congregations that had this problem. And congregations have split over this issue. It's a very divisive issue. It's one of those things that there's no middle ground. It's either you believe it and follow it completely or you totally reject it. There isn't anything in between and that's why it's divided so many places. Also, many people, once they have accepted this idea, have just quit. And by quit, I mean quit. Quit doing anything religiously and you'll see why. 
We won't be able to, to talk about it all tonight, but we'll talk some of it tonight and, Lord willing, some next Sunday night. But the thing about when you talk to someone about this, or you find out someone's involved in this, or you read something about this, <clears throat> is they have entirely different meanings to common words. Now, if I would ask you what the second coming of Christ was, we would all have the, we would know exactly what we're talking about. Well, if you would ask someone in this that believe this, do they believe in the second coming of Christ? They'll say, absolutely. But what they believe the second coming of Christ is was entirely different. If you ask them, do you believe in the resurrection? They'll say, absolutely. But it's not the resurrection you and I believe in. Do you believe that there's a judgment day? Absolutely. But it's not the judgment day you and I believe. So there is, and, and it's hard to get around the fact that it does seem to be very, very deceitful. When someone takes ordinary words and changes them, then it's hard to believe that there's anything sincere about that. <clears throat> We're just going to focus tonight on the second coming of Christ. Lord willing, next Sunday night, we will look at the resurrection and the judgment day. <clears throat> so those who believe this theory teach that all, all, every single reference to Christ's coming deal with His coming in judgment upon Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So every time... You read in the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation about Christ coming. Every single one of them, they believe, refers to Christ coming in judgment upon the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And that's the basis for their idea of the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> so yes, they believe in the second coming, but they believe it all happened in A.D. 70 when He came in judgment. Not coming personally, not coming literally, but coming figuratively or symbolically. Now, he certainly did that. The Bible teaches that he did come in judgment upon the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. The Bible is very clear that he did that, but that's not his second coming. When we go to Matthew chapter 24, where it talks about this, <clears throat> the context is always, of course, important. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, Jesus is in Jerusalem with his followers. He says in verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. To the Jewish apostles, to these Jewish disciples, they could not imagine life going on after the temple was destroyed. So they assumed that the temple being destroyed, the city being destroyed, uh, Christ coming back and all that was exactly the same thing. So see, they had the exact same misconception that these people do today. The exact same thing. They thought it was all going to happen at the same time. So Jesus comes back. <clears throat> the rest of the chapter separates the answers to those questions. He first comes back and answers the question. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. About the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of Judaism. He begins at verse 15 by saying... Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When you go to Luke's account, he talks about when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies. Well, they were surrounded by the armies. Jerusalem was surrounded by Titus, the general, the Roman armies, first century. So it was surrounded. So what does Jesus say when that happens? Get out of town. And that's what he says in the next verse. Get out of town. Leave quick. Run to the mountains. Get out of Judea quickly. If you're on a housetop, don't take anything. Get out of the house. If you're in a field, don't go back to get your clothes. 
<clears throat> and he goes on and says, There's going to be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. There's never going to be a tribulation like happened in A.D. 70. That's the worst one that's ever going to be. He made that promise. But notice what he says. Life's going to go on after A.D. 70. It's not going to end then. When Jerusalem's destroyed, that's not the destruction of the world. That's not the end of time. Life is going to go on because he says there are going to be other tribulations, but they will not be as severe as the one that happens in Jerusalem. He goes on and talks about, in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of the Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He'll send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They'll gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. He goes on and says in verse 33, So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Now, when's that going to happen? He says, Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So everything he's mentioned up to that point took place when? In that first century. So Jesus coming, that he talks about in those verses, Jesus did come. But he came symbolically. He came figuratively. He came in judgment upon the city of Jerusalem. So he was behind the destruction of that city. He was behind the destruction of Judaism. So he was behind it. He did come in judgment. But that was not his second coming, nor did it have anything to do with his second coming. His second coming was going to be what? It was going to be literal and it was going to be personal. And do I know that for sure? Absolutely. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. I don't know that I can hold it like that. Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 9. This gives us a key to His second coming. Now when He had spoken these things, talking about Christ... While they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, Jesus is physically, personally, literally with them. They can see him. They can touch him. Remember, they did that after he rose from the dead. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, okay, the, the same one you see is going to do what? Who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Okay, you saw him go into heaven. That's how he's going to come back. His second coming. You're going to see him. Did anyone see Jesus in AD 70? Absolutely not. No one ever makes that claim. See, right here it says... You will personally see him. There's nothing invisible about it. There's nothing symbolic about it. When he comes back, his final coming, his second coming, is going to be a literal coming, a personal coming. You will see him. Well, that forever destroys the idea of that A.D. 70 doctrine. But what do people do? They take all of these and completely give them new meanings to everything. And some of their redefinitions are beyond description. In Revelation chapter 1, <clears throat> we see something very similar to this teaching when he says this. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. What's going to happen? Every eye is going to see him. How many people saw him come to Jerusalem in A.D. 70? Not a single person. Not a single person. But when he comes the second time, there won't be a single person not see him. 
Everybody will see him because he's going to look just like he did when he went up. That's what the angel said. <clears throat> so we know for sure that his second coming was not in A.D. 70. His second coming is still in the future because people will see it. They'll experience it. And the Bible talks about it, and we don't have time to go into it, about all the things that accompany his second coming, none of which happened in A.D. 70. Not a single one. <clears throat> in Matthew, going back to Matthew chapter 24, <clears throat> the last half of that chapter talks about his second coming. The first half talked about his coming in judgment upon Jerusalem. The second part talks about his second coming. It's interesting, those that believe in, in various premillennial doctrines says that Matthew chapter 24 all refers to a second coming. But the people that believe in this AD 70 doctrine says it all has to do with what happened in the first century. And of course the truth is right in between. Part of it had to do with what happened in AD 70, the first half. The second half has to do with the second coming. And when you, when you read the whole chapter, that is so clear. But it's amazing how few people take the time to separate Matthew chapter 24. Very few people take that time. But yet if they do, it becomes very clear. The first half, all the way down to verse 35, says, will happen to those people in that generation. Those people he was talking to, they would experience it and see it. And they would. They would see the the destruction of Jerusalem, they would see all those things that he talked about was going to happen. They would see it and experience it. Now, beginning in verse 36, he says, but of that day and hour no one knows. See, he's talking about something entirely different now. Now he's talking about the end of the world, the second coming of Christ. The second part of the question the disciples ask him. So now he's responding to that. He says, no one knows when that's going to happen because there aren't going to be any signs. Be see, before the destruction of Jerusalem, there were tons of signs. He mentions there in the first part of the chapter all these things that were going to happen before Jerusalem was destroyed. But when he comes the second time, he says nobody knows when that's going to happen. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to be like a thief. When you least expect it, there's not going to be any signs. Everything's going to be going on as normal. Because he says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will, be, will the coming of the Son of Man be. Life's going to be going on like normal. There's not going to be some great period of tribulation before the, the second coming of Christ says right there. Things are going to be going on as normal. People are going to be eating like normal. They're going to be drinking like normal. They're going to be getting married like normal. Life is going to be normal. That's a guarantee. That's what Jesus said. It's going to be normal. Everyday life. There's not going to be some sort of antichrist Reveal. There's not going to be some sort of beast or dragon reveal. Nothing like that. Because life's going to be going on like normal. The normal activities will still be happening. <clears throat> Verse 42. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Verse 44. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So Matthew 24 completely destroys the A.D. 70 doctrine. Completely destroys it. And there's no way to misunderstand Matthew chapter 24 unless you want to. Unless you want to. Unless you want to believe something other than what it teaches. So the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, it was on a particular city. And it was on a particular nation and a particular people. But his second coming, his literal personal second coming, is going to involve all nations, not just the Jewish nation, 
we turn over one chapter to Matthew chapter 25. Jesus writes or says in verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him. And He will separate them one from another as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Did that happen in AD 70? Did everybody from the nation of Egypt come up to Jerusalem? Did everybody from <clears throat> the nation of Turkey come up there? It wasn't called Turkey then, but that area. Did all of those, did all the nations on the face of the earth, did everybody from China come? China was in existence then. Did all those people gather in Jerusalem? Well, of course they didn't. Well, then that wasn't the second coming. Because it says right here, all nations will be gathered before him when he comes again. But that didn't happen. Therefore, that wasn't his second coming. And lastly, life continued on earth after A.D. 70. We mentioned that. After A.D. 70, what did people do? They continued to do everything they had done before A.D. 70. People lived and, and died. They gave birth. They had jobs. They continued to farm. They did everything just like normal. But when Christ comes again, there's not going to be life on earth anymore. There's not going to continue to be any life on earth at all. In Luke chapter 21, <clears throat> these are the words of Christ. <clears throat> And then we'll go to 1 Thessalonians 4. And notice the difference. Notice the contrast between these two uh, descriptions. This one describes the destruction of Jerusalem. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For, the de for these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days... For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. What's going to happen? Things are still going to be going on. Life doesn't end, nor did it in A.D. 70. Life still goes on. There's still Gentiles. There's still... Uh, uh, People are still having babies. People are, are still doing all of these things. But when Christ comes back, notice what's going to happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, <clears throat> beginning in verse 16. Paul writes, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That doesn't sound like normal. The dead in Christ are not rising right now, nor have they been since A.D. 70. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Did that happen in A.D. 70 in the first century? No, it did not. So there is a vast difference in the New Testament between what happened in A.D. 70 and what's going to happen when Christ comes the second time. Those are not the same thing. And when people see that those are totally different, then that whole teaching about uh, realized eschatology and, and the A.D. 70 theory completely comes to nothing. But yet people are giving up their salvation. People... So many people, when they're taught this false teaching and believe it, they end up leaving the church. Why? Because there's no hope. In the A.D. 70 theory, and following this, there is absolutely no hope because everything happened in A.D. 70. Everything happened. No more prophecies whatsoever. We've been resurrected, we've been judged, and the world has came to an end. All of that is claimed to have happened in 8070. So no wonder people give up their faith and, and quit doing good or anything because there's nothing left if that's true. 
And so this is not some little teaching that has no real importance and we shouldn't worry about. Far from it. It has vast implications. And people have been caught up in it. And that's the sad part of it, just like any false teaching. They've been caught up in it and they will lose their destiny because of it. So we need to be aware of it, especially it's, it's been predominantly in the Midwest. Started in Ohio, but it, it, a lot of it has filtered into the Midwest uh, over the years. And that's why we have to be so aware of it. Next Sunday evening, Lord willing, we're going to look at two other main topics, the resurrection and the judgment day as seen by this particular teaching. It's so important that we study God's Word on a daily basis. We understand what it teaches, not just about salvation. Yes, we, know, we need to know what it, how we are to be saved, but we need to know so much more than that. You know, it's our responsibility. Just like the Jewish people were given the law and it was their responsibility, we've been given God's Word and it's our responsibility to keep it, to teach it, and to practice it. Be ready to obey it and defend it. It's our responsibility. Tonight we have this open invitation for you. And if you have that, that desire to uh, experience the new birth, if you need to ask for prayers, whatever it is, we encourage you to come as Travis leads us in this song. Let's stand, please.